Ich denke, wir können gut anfangen. Ich höre niemanden mehr die Treppe hinaufsteigen. Ich freue mich, Ihnen Herr Kirill Petkoff vorstellen äh, zu dürfen, der mittlerweile zum dritten Mal Gast in Bielefeld ist. Äh, 1995, 96 war er hier für zehn Monate. Daraus ist sein erstes Buch entstanden, das ich einmal umgehen lasse. Äh, dann, wenn ich mich recht entsinne, Kirill, 2012. Noch einmal als Humboldt-Stipendiat auf Einladung von Neidhard Bulls äh, hier für zwei, drei Monate gewesen. Und schließlich habe ich ihn dieses Jahr eingeladen und er ist der Einladung gefolgt und noch einmal für drei Monate nach Bielefeld gekommen. Das sind jetzt schon einmal die Höhepunkte seines Lebens. <lacht> Aber er ist auch sonst noch viel herumgekommen. Er hat äh, an der Universität Velikotanovo studiert in Bulgarien. Das ist die größte äh, bulgarische Universität außerhalb von Sofia. Er ist dann fürs Masterstudium an die Central European University in Budapest äh, gewechselt, wo er den Master gemacht hat, um anschließend in die USA zu äh, gehen. Dort hat er schließlich 2002 ein, seine PhD an der New York University abgelegt. Und wenn ich das von deinen Publikationen her richtig sehe, ist die, die Arbeit über den Friedenskuss, diese Dissertation, die in New York eben verfasst worden ist, erschien 2003, The Kiss of Peace, Ritual, Self and Society in the High and Late Medieval West. Seit 2004 ist er Professor, die anderen Stationen überspringe ich mal, seit 2004 ist er Professor für Pre-Modern Western European and Mediterranean. Seine Publikationen, die recht zahlreich sind, alleine die, die Bücher, die er verfasst hat, drehen sich im Grunde genommen immer um Themen des interkulturellen Austauschs zwischen auch Italien und dem Balkan und dem Osmanischen Reich. Insgesamt, er hat seine Research Interests so beschrieben, aller Arten sozialkultureller Geschichte, mittelalterlicher und äh, äh, early modern Europa und äh, eigentlich ist es eher East Iranian. Okay. Von Kirill sind bis auf dieses Exemplar äh, haptisch nicht greifbar, aber man kann sie online einlesen, sind also alle digitali als Digitalisate über die Bibliothek einsehbar. Sein aktuelles äh, Forschungsprojekt, mit dem er sich auch bei der Humboldt Stiftung beworben hat, ist heute Gegenstand seines Vortrags. Es geht um das Chaos, eine, äh, die Entwicklung einer westlichen Denkform in der Zeit von 1500 bis 1700. Also, äh, vielleicht kann ich noch erläutern, Kirill spricht auf Englisch. Er versteht besser Deutsch, als er zugibt. Aber äh, es geht ihm entgegen, die Fragen auf Englisch zu stellen. Ansonsten müssen wir uns in irgendeiner Weise behelfen. Ob ich da als Übersetzer tauglich bin, war ich zum Zweifel, aber wir finden eine Lösung. Okay. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Es ist mir eine Freude, heute Abend noch mal bei Ihnen zu sein. Obwohl mit einiger Bequemmenheit stehe ich auf dieser Seite des Schreibtisches. Es war viel bequem auf anderer Seite sein, aber ja, das Schicksal Man muss das auch machen. Und Zunächst möchte ich äh, derjenigen danken, dass, äh, dass diese Auftritt äh, möglich gemacht haben. Und äh, Herr Schuster hat das auch äh, genommen. Dass, äh, zuerst, das ist äh, der äh, Humboldt Stiftung, die meine äh, Forschung finanziell unterstützt hat. Und äh, äh, dem Herrn Professor Bulst, der erst mal vor Jahren meine erste Chance gegeben hat, hier in Bielefeld zu sein und zu recherchieren. Und nun Herr Professor Schuster, der meine aktuelle Anfrage so freundlich unterstützt hat. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Und jetzt, dass Herr Schuster gesagt hat, ich, wenn Sie mich entschuldigen, wäre meine letzten Worte auf Deutsch und ich werde es versuchen, zumindest für die Präsentation, ich werde es versuchen, Fragen ins, äh, in, in mein äh, Pidgin-Deutsch zu beantworten, äh, wenn ich kann. 
Und äh, bitte entschuldigen Sie das. Und äh, wenn ich nicht in der Lage bin, äh, verfalle ich wieder ins Englische. So, vielen Dank für die Verständnis. Ja. Also, so, uh, I will begin with the usual preliminaries. Just the, the generals, uh, I think it's important to mention them. Uh, two caveats. First, I present, as uh, Professor Schuster just mentioned, a larger project, part of a larger project. My plan is the uh, uh, history of the Western concept of chaos uh, in its formative period to the early modern era, 1500-1700. And uh, tonight I will only cover the German experience with which I kind of jump-started uh, my project. And uh, I do have, of course, have to add Italian, French, uh, English, a little bit Spanish and from the low countries to form the whole thing. Uh, it looks like a very big project, but uh, it, it is manageable, I have found out, especially after two and a half months already here, I have jumped uh, a lot into the German experience. And I think it, it, it is doable, actually. I've been, this idea has been in my mind for uh, quite a long time, but it's been, what, about a year now that uh, the artificial intelligence come into being, and I began seeing this invisible artificial handwriting on the wall behind me, Manel, Tecker, Ifarsim, I said, okay, you know, man, you got to do that, otherwise this artificial silicon thing is going to write it and maybe not for the, for the better. So I got to write that. So uh, that's the, the, the plan, right, to make these uh, uh, separate experiences ultimately of uh, French, Italian, German, uh, uh, Spanish, how do they actually build together and feed into each other to create this concept of, uh, of chaos. Second, it's a work, uh, work in progress, right? And I have not yet processed even the German material which I managed to collect to gather. And that was my, actually my primary focus uh, to gather uh, the material and to have uh, next month uh, or year to process it, but I force myself to do it now because I very much will appreciate any kind of input I can have from you either now or later on if something comes to your mind, say, hey, Carol, you know, there is this thing about chaos which I thought about, but I couldn't, you know, uh, verbalize it right away. So all I say is just a preliminary and I'm aware that I may be raising more questions, more why question, what, what did he say, right? Uh, that kind of question rather than providing answers, but uh, I think this is uh, something that we have to, uh, we have to begin. With. So I'm grateful for any input. Now, why chaos? Well, two reasons. Uh, one theoretical, personal, and other, I would say, more empirical. I have always been personally fascinated with the dynamism of Western culture compared to other cultures. A major part of this dynamism is the ability of the West to uh, reconcile fundamental opposites and to keep them into a perennial tension, to keep them working together, a dialectical tension, so to speak, it's a constant struggle in which the opposites kind of reinforce each other. That's uh, something that other cultures don't do. If I say that, and I, I almost kind of physically uh, think that some of you will have the lamp coming on and see this perennial Chinese symbol of yin and yang, right? The, the two opposites that reinforce each other. Yeah, they may state it, but in fact, particularly so far as social history is concerned, they don't really do that, social cultural history, to put it this way. They don't really do it. Maybe our high thing, but if you think about Confucianism and puts it out, in China, these perennial opposites uh, uh, dialectic, it, it doesn't really exist. Uh, what the Chinese and other cultures do is to cancel opposition by erasing one of, of the subjects, in fact, or favor so heavily one side of these dialectical oppositions, oops, uh, these dialectical oppositions, so that uh, uh, the, uh, only highlights the overwhelming presence of the other. So chaos is one of these dynamic fundamental oppositions uh, for me uh, of the West. And uh, when we say chaos today, uh, when we say chaos today, we, we think we know what it is, right? I mean, to put it very simply, uh, chaos is a mess. Right? When, I, when I said to a friend of mine, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write, you know, to research and write a history of, of chaos, I said, what? I mean, just look around. That's, what the hell? Are you going to spend time and gonna, someone's going to pay you money to do that? I say, well, let me try, right? Chaos is a mess. Uh, so <laughs> as a pre-modern German text very often, particularly in the late 16th and 17th century, put it, uh, chaos, that is mishmash. Okay, that's it. What else do you want? Uh, there is no disagreement on chaos meaning, function, and valuation, right? It's quite clear. It's a disorder, 
and incompatibility, and it upsets established norms. Uh, and yet, uh, very much in precisely this sense, right, of, of disorder, of incompatibility, is the fundament of the uh, essence of Western tradition. You think about it, right? Egalitarianism is chaos, right? Uh, democracy is chaos. Uh, liberal market economy is chaos. It's all chaos. Uh, culture, particularly take Western innovation, right? Western innovation. Don't even start with artificial intelligence because we're going to go on until next week, right? Uh, innovation, it, 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 or what we call destructive invention, uh, which seems to be the primary way of inventing in the West, is chaos. So explicitly, on the one hand, we condemn chaos, say, oh, such a chaos, and I got to, got to deal with it. But implicitly, implicitly, we live by it. We live by it. And I would say that we in the Western society are socialized to seek the perpetuation and perfection of chaos. Implicit and explicit, once, once again, these two sides of the dichotomy. So chaos, therefore, is an essential Western category. It's a group by group. To me, obviously, not for the not for the people who put together the Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe, because if you open the collection, Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe, and you will see that there is no entry for chaos. There's no entry for chaos. You open the uh, similar collection for aesthetic uh, uh, basic categories, yet yeah, it is there, and very good one. You open religious basic categories, it is there. You open philosophical be uh, basic categories, and it is there. Not in the history categories, which, if you ask me, it's weird. Right? It's weird. Why is this so? Why we historians don't do that? Why don't we, don't we tackle that? So the question then is, right, um, if uh, chaos is systemic uh, for uh, Western modernity, if it's uh, this exploring this, uh, this concept uh, in early modern German culture, and other cultures as well, but for night and, and one part of my, my study, uh, essential part is the, the German culture, this exploring this uh, concept uh, tell us something about the German culture, pre-modern German culture, that we don't already know. Right? That we don't already know from other other uh, uh, studies. And my contention at this point is yes. After, uh, like I said, you know, Jeff started my, my work uh, two and a half months after two, two and a half months, I can say, yeah, the, it, it does tell me. But I will leave it to you to tell me what I'm, I'm mistaken with. <laughs> I, I, I can't be mistaken, of course. So once again, uh, when we look at it, uh, we say, OK, uh, 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 historians have not really asked that question uh, uh, for uh, uh, the importance of chaos in general, speaking. In the, mean, in the meantime, I'm quite sure that you already know, and everyone knows, that the sciences have developed an entire field, chaos theory, which is a very much in fashions, and practically every, every hard science uh, does work at least partially on the premises of, of chaos. I mean, mathematics particularly, but other, other hard sciences, all of them. In the humanities, there are some works on chaos in, in uh, let's say, in ancient Greece, uh, particularly the uh, uh, creation myths. There's something in biblical theology, in literary case studies. There's some pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good pieces here and there, right? Uh, but in comparison to the sciences, number one, there is no systematic survey of case. And, and uh, on the second part, the crop is very lean compared to what the sciences have done. Very lean, very little, very little has been made. And particularly the formative period of chaos, and that's the 1500, 1700, that's absolutely, uh, uh, practically unexplored. People have touched upon uh, some, uh, I would say, milestones, but the conceptual landscape that these milestones, the specific works that they map out, this conceptual landscape is uh, barren, nothing, nothing there. To me, this is a problem. I don't know about you, you know, everything that is a blank, uh, unexplored area to, as a historian, to me, it's a problem. It has to be filled in with something, you know? Uh, uh, and I think it's a problem for two, uh, specific, uh, two specific reasons. Uh, one of it is uh, anachronism. And I'll give you one example uh, very quickly, it's something that uh, uh, as historians we should be actually thinking about. Uh, upon any modern study on the 30 years war and the term chaos, uh, you, you flip a page and lifts out of it and hits you in the face. You flip a page and hits you in the face, right? And, and, and you gotta swat away chaos, 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 chaos to be able to follow what is going on there, right? It's so much uh, becoming part of the vocabulary of modern studies of, of the Third Year War. But if you open the primary material, if you open the evidence from the period, you won't see anything like this. Yeah, they 
mention chaos here there occasionally in a very specific circumstances, in a very specific context, and very few references. To uh, the, uh, in the course of what I was looking at, uh, the earliest reference to chaos characterizing the entire period of confrontation, religious and political confrontation going on in the late 16th and the 17th century, the first references I found to chaos, that bloody chaos period, uh, dates from 1708 which is already too late, if you think about it, right? Uh, after what has happened in the previous 200 years. So uh, this, to me, is an anachronistic, anachronistic uh, extension of a terminology there. And I think this impacts, and as a second thing, it uh, distorts the past. It impacts the uh, history's ar uh, uh, relevance, because what we do by using this terminology, uh, I write chaos, and immediately I call up an image that you have from your modern understanding of chaos. You don't go because you know what it is, right? It's a mess and everything that goes with it. And you don't think actually, well, uh, do I need to see what is this behind this chaos? Do I need to check it out, right? So what we're doing basically, we homogenize the past by projecting this modern concept, you know, unwittingly, uh, implicitly we project it Onto, onto the past. And the diversity of historical pathways and byways and option, which made history what it is, the meaning producing discipline par excellence is severely curtailed, right? So uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not opposing Begriff's Geschichte here, right? Not at all, to the contrary, I'm actually trying to do Begriff's Geschichte work over here. So next time they try to update the Geschichte, uh, 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 the group uh, Begriffe, uh, call me up on contributing an article on, on chaos there. What I'm doing, I'm just calling for historicity, for using properly and non-anachronistically -anachron uh, uh, a term that we just all kind of a knee-jerk reaction, we think we know what it is. So what is needed, therefore, is uh, what I would say a genealogy and archaeology, in the sense, partially in the sense of Foucault using it, right? Archaeology of the concept at the time of its formation as a category of a general use. And not only because I am a pre-modernist and I would like to see it as it gestates, as it's getting formed, but I also think this is indispensable for being able to understand the category's meaning as a whole. So tonight, I cannot do all the spade work, right, uh, in that archaeology. I'll just chart the trajectory of the, of the term in the German-speaking realm. Just until just before, uh, by the end of the 18th century, a host of the Sturm und Drang era, a host of German, uh, German thinkers, Kant, uh, Herder, Novalis, uh, 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 Schlegel, and um, ultimately Goethe too, defined chaos as a constant, positive, necessary phenomenon that, among other things, ushered the late pre-modern German world into modernity. Tracing that tradition, tracing what that tradition stepped on, it stepped on, on something. These people of the Sturm und Drang, so far as chaos is concerned, and that was an essential category for them, absolutely essential category for them, uh, uh, they stepped on something, and that something is unknown, uh, and I would like to shed some light on it, and of course it has to be connected to social, political, etc. Uh, development, but at least I would like to chart, uh, chart it out. So I think that will help us reveal some uh, 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 unexpected aspects of the social, cultural, and political evolution of the late pre-modern German society. And finally, uh, uh, the uh, preliminaries being here, oops, uh, one thing on method. I think that's important. First, this is not an anecdotal uh, evidence study that I'm trying to do. Uh, I wanted to have a representative sample. And to do that, uh, I use mass data in the sense that uh, so far I have uh, gone through approximately 4,200 references to chaos. This is almost 2,500 different works. Uh, for these two, two and a half months, say, well, that's, that's quite a lot. It's not that much. Some of them need to be uh, true, at least the context. Some of them can be just seen uh, how they're best. But I think it's very important to use mass data because in this way we can see patterns. Uh, we can see how different phrases, uh, different uh, uses of the term see from one genre to another, to, from one tradition to another. We start recognize these patterns, uh, which is not easy even, I think, uh, for the artificial intelligence to do uh, at this level, uh, but uh, uh, to me that's the only way to do it. Second, uh, I think it's very important to avoid what uh, you can call learned distortion, 
that is to say, not to, to try to be very much aware of the fact that learned culture, well, the top learned culture, uh, uh, is distorting the way in which, or can be distorting, could be distorting, the way in which the formation of a proper German concept uh, takes shape. So I focus on German texts, primarily on German texts, not exclusively, maybe 90% of the texts that I've used are German, uh, maybe 10% 10 or so, with one exception, Luther. Uh, with Luther, I used Latin and German texts interchangeably because I think it doesn't really make much difference in his case. Uh, but uh, uh, the rest is, the bulk of it is German text. Uh, the third, my third methodical premise, I think that may be something that you may disagree or may question. You see, well, that's eh, kind of shaky. I think it's a dicey argument, but it can be made. And I take the early modern printed, uh, printed communication as an open integrated system. That is to say, to me, local meanings attached to the term uh, percolate and sediment onto the term itself. So the concept uh, kind of fuses the, the gradual accruement of, of, of the concept, fuses into the term as the term migrates from one discourse to another. And in, in, in the process also absorbs impact from visual and from auditory, uh, auditory forms to finally shape into more or less kind of a more complex concept. So uh, that is, uh, again, uh, arguable thing. It's a dicey, dicey argument, but I think it can be made. And finally, uh, I do some selective cherry picking here and there. Uh, I just want to say that I'm very much aware of teleology. And uh, I'm, I've, I've put effort into making sure that I'm not constructing a grand narrative in any sense. I'm not leading uh, you or the evidence into some, some place. I let the evidence let me. Okay, that said, let's go into the, uh, uh, the beginnings. And the beginnings which, uh, uh, of the terms, like uh, everything else, uh, start with the Romans and, and the Greeks. Uh, this trajectory, early trajectory, is relatively well known, I would say well known. Uh, you can find it in a good deal of these great collections of aesthetic, philosophical, or religious uh, uh, compendiums, and I just sketch it over here because I thought it's important just to remember that there are origins there, right? So uh, if you start with the tradition, chaos uh, refers to uh, the creation of the world. Uh, it only existed in the past. Uh, it's not an event that repeats itself, and it has two meanings. The earliest image, quite complex one, is creation of the Hesiod, the myth maker of the beginnings of, of, of the Greek antiquities, right? Uh, in Hesiod's uh, understanding, chaos is a chasm. It's a gaping space. It's an emptiness resulting from a se separation of earth and sky. It's an infinite space and a place underneath earth, and ultimately a god-like phenomenon that gave birth to other gods. To simplify, the common denominator of all this, except the later, but even in the later, you can, you can see it actually shaky, uh, void. That's what characterizes Hesiod's understanding of concept of, of, of uh, chaos, void. Uh, then in late classical and then Roman, uh, Roman thought, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Ovid, and a host of other, other thinkers reformulated this term to uh, create another meaning. And that meaning is of uh, inchoate, material, moist clump of, uh, uh, that is set in darkness from which the world emerged. Both definitions on the one hand and formless mass on the other hand, agreed very nicely with the Hebrew creation story in Genesis 1-2, the so-called Tofu Babohu, according to uh, 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 the, the Vulgate, which describes the situation before God's crafting of the world as an ungraspable and unmeasurable, a fluid abyss, a formless darkness and confusion. So, this is the, the foundation. From that, we move very quickly again into a medieval reception. With these two meanings, void and formal and bas, it, uh, the concept of chaos kind of seeped into the Middle Ages. The Gospels of Luke uh, 1626 and the story of Genesis 1-2 in the Vulgate codified the first meaning, that of dark void, an abyss down there. Uh, Pre-scholastic theology, uh, above all here comes Gregory the Great, for example, and later on the hymnal, which is widespread, the hymns, of course, is something that the mass of the population will at least have some auditory perception. Of course, those who knew Latin 
of you'll be able, or it will be explained to those who didn't know Latin, you'll be able to get an acquaintance with. So uh, the, uh, this kind of tradition drew on, on, on uh, 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 that void perception of chaos to load the term of, with a meaning which is still with us. If you secularize it, and if you trivialize it, that's what we think, well, chaos is hell. Mm -hmm. They meant it, well, in, in a religious sense, right? Uh, in a, a metaphysical sense, but today, when say, oh, such a chaos, and I gotta deal with this, it's a hell, right? You know, that's something that kind of uh, uh, instinctively we tend to think of. Later, pre- and non-scholastic thought, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux uh, 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 kept between that concept. So, uh, between that tradition, uh, pre-scholastic and non-scholastic, like the affective uh, spirituality of uh, Bernard, uh, valued chaos negatively, right? As void and even more so as confusion. Uh, the novelty with uh, that tradition is that they began applying it to contemporary times as well, metaphorically, but they began applying it so chaos started getting some contemporary, contemporary meanings as well. Scholastic tradition, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on the other hand, when it came into being, added a very much positive dimension to chaos. Uh, it formulated the other pole of this dichotomy, this opposition, right, positive, negative. Uh, perhaps the most, the earliest, uh, uh, the earliest proponent of this, Thierry of Chartres, uh, who rejected this order and says that, well, uh, chaos may be anything, but it's actually uniform. Essentially, it's uniform. It's not disorderly. So you cannot have, when something is uniform, you cannot have disorder in it. It kind of takes out some of the negativity out of it. Uh, uh, Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas and other luminaries added to this, but there's one true theorist of chaos, and that's Sermon Lul in the late, uh, late 13th century. And Lul has a, a very serious kind of scholastic uh, discussion of chaos, and he, he views it as something that's intentional, didn't come out of, of, of nowhere, right? It's complex, it's orderly, and it's a natural phenomenon that's crafted by God, of course. So chaos for Sermon Lul is a prime matter, it has shape, it's like a sphere. It has boundaries. It's not kind of a fuzzy, fuzzy around the, on, on the borders, right? And it has limits, obviously. So it, it's something that you can actually, you can tackle, you can see it, you can, you can touch it almost, right? It contains, this chaos contains with itself, and here I quote, all five universals, all 10 predicates, all causal seeds, end of quote. You know, it's a typical scholastic way of you know, adding um, different um, uh, aspects to it. And from all this, all uh, uh, things were produced uh, through various permutations. So it had to be complex to, to give birth to all these transmutations. Chaos, this, in, in uh, Ramon Lou's perception, is a dynamic potentiality in flux. Rather than stasis, it's not fixed. It moves, right? Uh, it's a historical event, again, it was in the past, and uh, uh, it, it transitions from cause, causal seeds to species to individuals. Uh, the scholastic legacy of chaos, therefore, is largely positive, largely positive. Uh, there's orderliness, there's complexity, uh, there's process rather than stasis. It's a creative, encompassing potentiality. That's probably the most important thing out there. So the German branch of this scholastic tradition is very thinly documented, not much about it. Uh, the one bridge between the classical scholastics of uh, Western Europe and the Central European German tradition is Nicholas of Cusa. But Nicholas of Cusa is fully between this tradition of Ramon Lu. And uh, uh, to him, chaos is a historical phenomenon, happened in the past. Um, and um, it is the natural beginning, the seed of this formless power of transformation. So chaos is power in that sense, and it's the ultimate possibility of all things. So this is what we have before the proper age of print and the proper German reception uh, as a foundation of what will be later on developed in the German-speaking area. That's a bifurcated tradition, I would say, uh, at which at the start of the age of print, somewhere between 15, uh, 1450 and 1500, the principal uh, German genders, that is theology, uh, uh, natural philosophy, uh, humanism as, was, uh, as it was developed in Germany, fiction, uh, uh, media, popular folklore, uh, performance, they began all elaborating on this notion of, of chaos. It's quite a, quite a rich tradition, actually. 
and it develops very quickly. Uh, and I would like to emphasize two points. First is cross-pollination. That all of these traditions interacted and fed into each other. And that's uh, very easy to see when, when you look at the author, for example, and you see that uh, someone who writes on chaos or just casually, you know, uh, casually can just throw a, the word chaos, the term chaos, and you know that this guy is a physician, right? A doctor who studied uh, medicine and studied, let's say, Paracelsus. And then he is an amateur theologian, and he knows his uh, ancient author, so it's, uh, he's steeped in the humanistic tradition. Here we have three things, right? And then that same man happened to be, or one occasion actually a woman as well, uh, only one, not only one, more than one, but I have one uh, in mind. Uh, and, and that same man uh, or woman is actually uh, someone who likes to popularize all three and, and writes a popular compendium that the common man and woman would read, all those literally. So in that sense, you can see this cross-pollination in action because all the same person, all these different genres kind of come together in the mind of one and the same person. So the traditions, they're not hermetic, they, they mingle. And the second, there is uh, evolution, uh, the, so cross-pollination and uh, uh, evolution. So meanings will leach from one tradition into the other as the author straddled, uh, straddled boundaries and genres morphed from one another. And by 1675, that's my contention at this point, somewhere between 1650 and 1675, the, uh, the term chaos uh, came to connote a relatively stable field, reached a peak. Uh, it's like an iceberg in the Northern Ocean, right? You have a peak that's a small peak that's a relatively visible above, above uh, 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 the waters, uh, and then underneath is a huge mass, right? And that iceberg, uh, circulated quietly for about a century between 1670 and uh, 1770 or 1780 when the Sturm und Drang began. And then the Sturm und Drang people they kind of hailed it steep to say, hey, look, look at this thing, right? It, this is a good, interesting thing. Uh, and uh, then kind of receded from sight and began operating again as an undercurrent. And nowadays, the positive side of this undercurrent only occasionally comes to the fore uh, uh, while we have taken as guidelines the negative side of, of the tradition. So let me then go into the negative and the positive side of these two tradition, of these two traditions as they uh, kind of uh, evolved into, into, the German, into the German tradition. So uh, let's first start with the negativity, the current of negativity. Around the year uh, 1500 or so, the term still carried somewhat neutral connotations, somewhat neutral connotations. Latin German dictionaries and lexicons appearing somewhat later in the uh, first quarter of the 1500s uh, captured earlier, earlier usages and they put it simply, chaos is the mixing of all things. No qualifications. They don't say it, no, no, no way. Oh, mixing of all things, but is it good? Is it bad? Is it positive? Is it negative? Does it have anything to it? They, they have nothing. Even mixing was not necessarily bad as we see in, in some of these dictionaries, right? Some of the early reformers uh, in the uh, beginning of the second quarter of uh, the 1500s, uh, Johannes Eberlin, for example, used Luke's uh, 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 literal meaning of chaos as a chasm, again without uh, any kind of qualification. It's a, it's a chasm, okay, but all right, it's a chasm. You know, nothing inherently ontologically either positive or bad in it. Also from that period and throughout the 16th, 17th century, actually, it was common to qualify chaos Usually the qualifiers come as confused chaos or Babylon of a chaos. Now both things have negative connotations, uh, both confusion and Babylon, obviously from the religious or non-religious tradition, secular tradition, uh, these two are relatively negative. But uh, to me, the fact that you need to qualify chaos, to say that it's a confused chaos, or a Babylonian chaos. That means that the negative meaning was not ontologically latched onto the term. So the concept has not acquired negative things if you need to qualify it. If you don't need to qualify it, if you just accept it, yeah, it, 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 chaos means a bad thing, means confusion, means Babylon, then you don't need to qualify it, at least for the time being. By the 1520s, however, things changed very rapidly and for the worse. The term was increasingly filled with negative content, the term itself, without any qualifications, and it came to connote contemporary human affairs. In the vitriolic polemic of the Reformation, 
stripped of any kind of positivity, chaos became the metaphor of choice for radical alterity. And you can see that throughout in, in, in uh, the, the 16th century. Precedents, earlier precedents, there were. For Jochen Geller, for uh, Kaiserstags, for example, chaos is a gap, but also a swampy, broken mess of a confused lump. So that's sh shading into, into the negative side, right? Jochen Heinlein, a, the prior of uh, Nuremberg's Dominicans, sent to chaos at the beginning of the 1500s again, uh, read hell. Actually, that's late, late 15, beginning of the 1600s. Uh, read hell, uh, he sent to, to chaos, Christianity's inner uh, 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 others, that's the sinners. Uh, for that was the place where the souls of the proud went. They went to chaos. Uh, what mattered now was chaos as a void, abyss and emptiness, of course, uh, but that void, abyss and emptiness denoted a lack, lack of true belief. So if it's an emptiness, it's an emptiness of belief, obviously it's negative, obviously it is, it's a problem. That's why Luther made chaos the abode of the living damned in the here and now. That's pretty much across uh, Luther's, uh, Luther's rhetoric, you can see that over and over and over again. Catholicism, and the operation of the papacy, where Luke's void and wasteland, right? Uh, lack of substance, read lack of Christ, spawned different sects, the mosaic images of confusion. Catholics and evangelicals were incompatible, and between them was this chasm of chaos, right? Between the two uh, denominations, so to speak. And all that that was between them was hell and darkness. It was the, the realm of Satan. By uh, uh, this, this image began very strongly applied in these controversies that went on during the uh, first uh, half a century of the Reformation, but it also expanded and went uh, beyond uh, the Western European territory, because by the 1550s, we already have the Muslims uh, getting into the same club of those who live in, in chaos. Uh, a quote, the Quran is nothing else but a chaos and a mix of manifold blasphemies as were well all other heresies of the time. In the uh, beginning of the 17th century, very beginning of the 1600s, of the peak of a military conflict with the Ottomans, their general domain was defined also that way, as a chaos. So not just the religion of the Ottomans, but the political system of the Ottomans, the society that existed in the Ottomans, it was a chaos. Uh, flash forward another 60, 70 years, and you have the French very end of the 1600s, the French become the chaos. 1701, the Poles are the chaos. And in the second decade of the 1700s, the Italians, of course, are the chaos. As more and more Germans have start going to Italy and say, well, what a chaos this is, right? So little by little, these others all become uh, people of chaos. So between the theological take of chaos, therefore, otherness obtained these social political nuances. The term began to be associated with a concept that has these social political nuances. Uh, it's something to be seen very early on, once again, for Johannes Kochleus, for example, and Kaspar Frank. The Husische House was what Luther was uh, propagating. That is a radical religious egalitarianism. Uh, and that's obviously a damnable sub uh, a subversion of, of society's spirit hierarchy. Uh, Adam Wallacer, a, uh, I would say, somewhat of an amateur theologian in the 1570s, uh, added to this the knowledge field. Uh, chaos to him is everybody has the right to read scripture. That's complete chaos. That cannot be. That, that, that just cannot be allowed. Now, evangelicals obviously disagreed with that. You know, everybody has the right to read the, to read the scripture, but they use the same notion. For uh, without lay authority, the world was, quote, confusum chaos, ein unwohnliche Kluft, ein ägyptische Labyrinth, is how you put it, ein babylonische Tiergart, ein Zerrüttung aller guten Sitten, end of quote. It appears that the void and the emptiness of earlier times were now teeming with abominations. So, accruing empirical damnations in that sense sublimated conceptual lack into epistemology. In the quarrel over who had the truth, Catholics versus uh, uh, Protestants, uh, we had the knowledge. 
The other had chaos. That's an alternative, once again, out there. Uh, Luther was, of course, wallowing in, in chaos for Johannes Eck. Radicals of both camps, be they evangelicals, be they Catholics, uh, were in chaos for moderates, such as Georg Meyer of Lieder, or lay people interpreting scripture, just as I mentioned for Adam Wallacer, uh, they were the chaos, the embodiment of the chaos themselves. So lack led to improper epistemology, and scholastic, theorist, uh, scholastic theology, of course, was chaos for Luther, because they lacked the proper attitude, epistemologically speaking. Uh, on the grandest possible scale, so far as epistemology is concerned, as Erasmus of Rotterdam had it, reason and knowledge faced chaos, that is to say, reason and knowledge face ignorance, that is, lack, nothingness, chaos again. Uh, German Christian humanists chimed in right away into that theological kind of a, a, a theological uh, controversy, and by 1550s, joined theology to paint the void of chaos as darkness and blackness. And you think about it in the uh, uh, conditions of lack of artificial light, these are scary, scary concepts, like darkness and, 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 and blackness. For poets like Christoph Wirzung, who reflected in 1559 on contemporary Christianity, chaos was the receptacle of all abomination, quote, a dark chaos where there is no bottom and no end. Dark abyss, void, dark fog, see, dark and dark and dark, he piled these things, and where there is no end of error, stink, filth, sickness, where all godlessness dwells. It's quite strong, isn't it? So this, new, this, this image indicates uh, uh, the, the well establishing of a new trend already in, in, in the 1550s. Uh, chaos was uh, by now filled with too much of a revulsive matter to remain simply a void. Images such as Leerheit uh, persisted. They resurfaced uh, occasionally as verwüstet chaos to denote the ravages of, of uh, uh, the 17th century wars. Uh, and uh, when chaos is used in this context, it means Total annihilation. Virtually nothing remains on the ground for an author to use chaos. And again, these are very, very rare uh, uh, from the massive material that I have surveyed, very rare images of images of, of chaos. Something has to be t totally annihilated in order uh, for the word chaos to be used uh, in contemporary 16th, uh, 17th century works. In the 18th century, like I said, uh, we have already kind of a, a general application of the word, but not, not in the 17th century. I have not found, I have not come across. There might be some, I just haven't come across it uh, yet, and I make conclusions on what I have, uh, what I have seen. So by the 15th century, however, another conceptual aspect took the lead. Chaos as a clump which seeped in a roster of disciplinary fields uh, moving from one gender to another. From the early 1600s, uh, lexicons of chemistry and alchemy defined chaos as mixture or undifferentiated mass. Uh, that sort of can be seen almost immediately in poetry. Martin Opitz, one of the foremost poets of the German tradition, uh, and theologians also uh, uh, spread the same image. Yet, clump is kind of cost, right? Uh, it does not exclude multiplicity. The image of multiplicity, therefore, it's a clump, but it's a clump composed of different things. And if it's a clump, there is a things that have certain discreteness in them. Uh, these images seeped into different discourses from politics to administration to penal law. Valuations differ, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. But that, uh, to me, matters not. What matters to me is to become complex. In 1654, for example, Johann Danhauer condemned papists for their ungeordentliche, ungestaute chaos, ohne Form, Ornat, Ordnung und, und, und Unterschied. He had image of lump peaks and shades into a new conceptual domain. A third trend, therefore, set in since the late 1500s, chaos as a condition, not as a thing, not as a void, not as a lack of condition, right? Chaos is a condition, the condition namely of disorder and confusion. Wirrwarr, put, put it simply as uh, some of the dictionaries put it. Catholic theology was foremost in spreading this out. Wirrwarr, both in terms of the diversity and multiplicity of reformed denominations, and the separation of church and state as well. 
chaos came to denote the total breakdown of social hierarchy as well and traditional power structures. So when an author uses, specific author uses, uh, oh, it's a chaos, uh, he would mean that anything from a relationship between children and peasants and nobles, from subjects to authorities, all this has broken down, this is a chaos. Traditional power structures being demolished or upended or non-existent at all. In the early 1600s, the stress shifted to the unrelatedness and incompatibility. So it's not just different things out there, right? Uh, not just different things standing next to each other, but these things are unrelated, incompatible. So we have expressions such as unglicher ding. Uh, even the, the clump stopped being used in the definition of, of, of chaos, and you will say, well, chaos, chaos that's a lot of unglicher ding. That's it all. Uh, social and religious arrangement, I would say, have shifted somehow to create this tension of incompatibility between uh, social units and the, the, the discourse on chaos uh, responded. Uh, some sort of incongruity was, was taking shape in society and that incongruity, that challenged hierarchy, leadership, and uh, uh, fostered a new sensibility to uh, incompatibility of entities that are encompassed by a political or military conquest, for example. Uh, and finally, I would like to add to this point that uh, by 1702, we already have an adjective, chaos not just as a substantive, but as an adjective. The word uh, uh, chaotic appears, uh, introduced most likely by Leibniz, uh, using a French, a French example, and uh, 1700s dictionaries sealed this trend using vermischter klumpe together with eine urnordnung when they spoke about chaos. So this is generally the, uh, this trajectory of uh, the negative side. Now, alongside this trajectory, run another valuation, uh, a stream that mirrored this general negative evolution of chaos, uh, mirrored this typology, right? But with the opposite sign, the sign of positivity, explicit positivity here. So this positivity reveals itself between several taxonomies, and I will uh, go over uh, quickly over all of them, and progresses along a certain axis. So we have several fields, several taxonomies in which that changes, and all, they all together go along, evolve around uh, a certain axis. And in order to figure out the axis of change, uh, we need to go into each of the taxonomies briefly and see what, what changes there. A key point is a radical novelty that informs all of the taxonomy and, and, and of the taxonomies, and that uh, positivity uh, was created by what I would call, or what we can call, I should not die, but what we can call the Paracelsian moment in natural philosophy. So it's not so much theology, obviously, which is very negative, demonizing chaos. It's not so much humanism, which found some sort of delight into di diversity, right? Uh, but it's uh, natural philosophy, and particularly Paracelsus. So the Paracelsian moment seeped into German culture just as the theologian began demonizing chaos. In a throwback to, to Lou, to Roman Lou, Paracelsus' chaos is not a void, not a lump, and not a confusion. It's an aggregate of discrete units. Paracelsus postulated three typologies of chaos. One, distinct homogeneous entities, such as chemical or alchemical elements. Each of these, a chemical element is a chaos in itself. An alchemical element is a chaos in itself. Second, uh, discrete components of a larger system. Worlds with their own arrangements and sensible rational dwellers. So each of the primary elements in the air it's a world of its own, it has dwellers of its own, these are rational beings, they organize themselves. Earth, they're rational, sensible beings living in the earth. Our world, so we humans live in this world, so each of these worlds is designated as chaos in its own. And finally, the physical world that we all inhabit, this is a chaos also. So the term is used for the entire world as a chaos as well. Uh, Three key points here. Actually, one more thing is that uh, uh, Paracelsus saw the human body as a chaos. It was a chaos too. So three key points here. Chaos is the first cause. It has agency of its own. 
Chaos is a complex, rational, orderly, and a sophisticated unit. These are the all kind of the conceptual connotations that uh, revolve around the term as used by Paracelsus. And uh, discrete elemental domains where rational species dwell coexist in the greater chaos of our world. Species move between habitats, though normally they prefer to stay put in their own. So these are very, very important, I would say, heuristic uh, 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 pathways which the Paracelsian moment creates. And the, uh, this uh, uh, theory of Paracelsus provided a heuristic tool for re rethinking positively the entire conceptual area of the, uh, of, of the term chaos. Take agency. Take agency. By the early 1500, for Johann Geller, right, the, the preacher, uh, chaos had no potential. I mean, void really cannot have potential, right? Alchemists, however, back to differ. In the 1520s, just one example, in the 15, uh, sorry, in the 1590s, apologize, 1590s, we hear about virgin chaos. So just a void, but it's a virgin void, right, in a sense, with potential to conceive. There's got to be something there to be able to conceive, uh, given God's, uh, God's agency. Uh, in the 1620s, Jakob Böhme, in a perfect mix of philosophy, theology, natural science, well sprinkled with Kabbalism and, and mysticism, uh, put it very simply, chaos is God. Chaos is God. Uh, chaos is God's wisdom. Chaos is God's will. Chaos is God himself. Now, this is the image of absolute, absolute agency, you know, focused on, on God. Uh, agency was still God's, but that was to change too. Already uh, before that, in the 1580s, an alchemist, Gerhard Dorn, claimed that humans, with their knowledge of chemistry and alchemistry, of course, can fabricate, can fabricate, humans can do that, uh, their own wonderful chaos, that is, their own habitat. Uh, just note, wonderful, they can first, humans can do it, but it's also wonderful. There's a qualification that's quite the opposite of the darkness, the abyss, etc., etc. So, uh, 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 Dorn, of course, thinks in narrow, narrow uh, alchemist terms, but still, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, these mean it's kind of a sediment, and if one person is using them in different fields, they kind of a leap from one field uh, to another and, and uh, go into this larger conceptual, uh, conceptual definition of, of chaos. In 1650, right after the Thirty Years' War, uh, Hartmann Kreide gave agency to humans but charging them with uh, forging a desolate, desolate chaos. And 1676, the preacher Prokop of Templin agreed. God had created chaos as part of order. But human simpletons, with ideas that did not sink, you know, did not sink well together, made it a disorder. Chaos, and that's the important thing, is all too human. Agency is human. And uh, uh, to counter that negativity, so far we've seen humans mostly destroying by creating chaos. To counter that negativity, Erhard Weigel, a moral statistician, and if there is such a thing, a moral statistic, obviously very popular in the 17th century, uh, in 1674, he says that uh, the emergence of civil society as we know it, with the institutions, with the norms that we have, out of the chaos following the fall, was the product of human action. God inspired human action, but nonetheless, humans themselves shaped chaos in a civil society. It's an amazing thing, you think, what, what, you, can attach, what you can attach to chaos now. So, two years later, in 1676, Joachim von Sandart, a uh, artist and architect, we're going to see something of it now, viewed chaos as, quote, the father of all things. Now, it seems like a metaphor, but the fact is that the image that it conveys is that of a male active, creative think. 18th century notions, and uh, to flash forward to the uh, uh, late 18th century period, from Bodmer's poetic abyss, where the old honor chaos reigns, once again the same, same idea, to Kant's self-modifying uh, chaos, uh, just recontextualize that same idea of inherent agency. So chaos is inherently capable of action. It's an agent by itself, ontologically. Then, uh, after agency, we got to look at organization. Now, Kluft and Mishmash lack order, obviously, but already in Luther's starkly negative image of chaos, 
there is a strong complicity between chaos and order, simply for the same thing that they're all created by God. And there's a lot, if you look at the late uh, 1600s, early 17, 1700s uh, writings, there's a lot of arguments over there. Oh, uh, did God create chaos? And did actually God create chaos before everything else? Or everything else was there? So there's this thing, but ultimately kind of all points out it was all God's idea. It was all God's uh, a plan. So if that is, then chaos is part of God's plan. It, it, it cannot be totally negative. It's got to be something positive in it. And actually, uh, uh, there's kind of a, 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 a written words, but because one picture is more, uh, is worth more than, than or two pictures are more than uh, 2,000 words, I <laughs> wanted to illustrate uh, this notion with two pieces over here. Uh, the left is actually from Sandart that I uh, quoted several times already. It dates from the 16, uh, 1680, and it's part of his Iconologia Deorum, the Iconology of Gods. Uh, the right one is a Dutch engraver. It dates from the 1620s. Um, and uh, I, I have a couple of, it's Dutch, right? It's not German properly. But I do have a couple, I do have a couple of uh, references to, to this circulating in, in general area being actually uh, perceived and commented on by, by German writers. So what do we have here? It's, it's a very interesting development, right? Uh, chaos is supposed to be what? Chaotic. Hmm? And if you look at the left one, obviously there is quite uh, an irregular uh, depiction of things, right? Very much irregular depiction. It's a decentered, uh, there's not quite clear action going on, but at the same time, that's, that's at first glance. And look closely, you see that, yeah, it, it may be irregular, but it is by no means random. It's not random. You see, the, the, the first thing you see actually is the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the zodiac, the signs of the zodiac, that around the edges of these fuzzy things that were like lava uh, sprouting out of a, of a volcano, you see the, how, how nicely they are positioned, how nicely they are arranged. In fact, all of the actions all there had uh, very much non-random, non-random perception to them. And of course, that same non-randomness and this creative God, you know, throwing matter and any other stuff. But then again, all this is kind of very nicely put together in these very regular, very regular shapes, right? So this kind of uh, confusion here creates an image, a very strong image of uh, non-random irregularity. Right? If, if I can, can put, put these two together. Non-random uh, irregularity is something that you can see very nicely. I think that's, that's, that's the uh, uh, excellent uh, synthesis of the whole thing is uh, uh, Grimmelshausen Perpetual Calendar. And that's the, uh, the beginning page of Grimmelshausen, which we know all in, uh, with the Simplicimus. But if you open the Simplicissimus, you will not see chaos there. The word, the term does not exist there. Nonetheless, in the calendar, which was uh, uh, written in 1671, you do have something that gives you a very nice idea of how uh, chaos uh, had come to be perceived. What do we see here is a perpetual calendar, and just look at the right uh, part of the title, right? When he gives uh, the definition of what is the, the chaos, I mean, uh, uh, as a student, you can write a term paper just on this page if, you, if you're interested in it, right? Uh, uh, you see chaos, first of all, you see that is in Roman characters. Uh, what was that? In the, the red one, right? Okay, so it's a Roman characters. It's smaller font than uh, the top of the line with the, with the Gothic characters. Uh, and then, uh, then he says, okay, chaos is, uh, that's a Okay, all right. So what is what is uh, here? Well, then look at look at the actually organization of the page, and there's nothing fervorness here, and and there's quite a lot of ordnung here too. On on the left side, you have the organization of time according to Christian saints. So the uh, the, the saints dates organized quite nicely, quite orderly the whole year. Then you go into the middle column, and in the middle column you see Roman columns again, organization of time according to the to the Roman columns. And on the right hand side you see seasonal activities of the peasants that go one after another here according to the progression of the seasons. That all is very organized. It has nothing to do with fervor, right? I mean, I don't see how that can be disorganized. I don't see it any other way. It's actually triple organized to make sure that nobody gets confused in there. So, so he labels it right, uh, uh, order chaos, order fervorness, mishmash, order ani ordnung. But uh, later on uh, down here, he continues to say, well, you know, it's a very pleasant garden and, and a labyrinth. 
So he shows in these images, chaos is a pleasant God. And so the, the immersion in chaos is a pleasant experience. And it's, it's a labyrinth, and I, I don't know, but I don't think there's anything chaotic in a, in a labyrinth. Labyrinth is a pretty well-organized place, so you don't get out of it. Right? It's, it's, it's well-intentionally made so. So uh, uh, chaos, therefore, if you get immersed in what Grimmelshausen offer, offers you here, offers a, 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 a orderly, enjoyable journey, a useful and explicitly necessary experience as the only exposure to and full immersion in chaos is the most fundamental knowledge-producing endeavor you can have. Immerse yourself in chaos and you will know everything. According to the Christian tradition, right? According to the Roman tradition and according to the tradition of the common man out in the fields. So you have it all here. So <laughs> typologically, Barthold Broke's uh, 1746 allusion to society as, uh, quote, an orderly chaos, order Karl Moritz in 1789, right, the year of the French Revolution, when he wrote, uh, again, quote, ein Chaos ohne Verwirrung und end of quote, they don't add anything to that image. That image was already there in uh, 1671, right? That's one whole, whole hundred years before what we have with the Sturm und Drag people and even uh, later in the, in the 18th century. So these developments can be seen also in terms of composition. Here again, chaos begins in the early 1500s with absolutely homogeneity of the void. You know, the dark void that is unknowable, it's homogeneous. It's, you can't really say what it is. Or if you uh, look at the clump, the relative uniformity of the formless, undifferentiated clump or prime matter. Already by the middle of the 16th century, however, theolo theologians stressed the discreteness of the parts in the clump. In 1620, on the political frame, there's a flux shrift, political flux shrift, right, on the conditions of the Reich, of the empire. And he says, well, the Reich is a chaos because it's a very complex politics of discrete and incongruous, yet interacting, interacting parts. Uh, in contemporary administrative practice, again, uh, 1640s, 1650s, if you look at some of the uh, uh, kind of a letters coming from administrators of, of the empire, uh, incongruity was not necessarily negative. It just meant, well, too many things and tricky management. That's what it is. It's not, not, nothing else. In popular lore, the Paracelsian image of discrete worlds, right, but permeable worlds, seemed very nice there. So just one example, in uh, 1614, a certain guy called Heinrich Kormann, a professor of rhetoric, a colleague, at Marburg had to allay popular anxiety over venuses and nymphs, read voluptuous female pagan spirits, right, uh, who opted to leave their chaos and to come into the human chaos uh, led by curiosity, or by anything but curiosity. Thankfully, they got to live in, in, in uh, caves so the you know, faithful Christians don't get seduced by them. So this trench uh, reached the peak of permeability of, of the chaoses, reached the peak in the 1650s when it was popularized by one of the greatest names in the field of popularizing, uh, Johannes Pretorius. To sum it up, you know, if you were living back in the mid-1600s, uh, well, everybody knew that the human world is a complex chaos because this is the terminology used. Uh, part of a larger chaos, right, composed of other interactive chaoses, with rational beings. Right? The notion of complexity was reinforced by uh, visual imagery. Pageants in, in the 16, beginning in the 1630s, or uh, processions and, and ceremonies, uh, uh, very often uh, symbolizing new beginnings, like for example, a wedding, right? Or for example, the entry of a ruler into the city in the early 1700s, there's one, uh, one of such an example. Uh, they all show in souls kind of imagery of uh, primary elements mixing and mingling. But if you're a observer and you see a huge float with a machinery that makes chaos, right? What you see is several mechanical parts. It's kind of very nicely and smoothly operating. You don't see chaos the way we You see a smoothly operating, well sink well-oiled machinery. So that point leads me to the next, actually. That's the structure. Because once you have complexity, you have to have structure. The void and the lump, 
of chaos of old, they need no structure. But once you have complexity, you have to have structure. Once complexity begins to creep into the concept, structure becomes imperative. So the ensuing definition that we have mishmash, right, uh, which a condition that many uh, uh, late 16th and early 17th century authors bewailed that mishmash, right, makes chaos a forced lumping of entities that do not belong together. Uh, the incongruity, of course, when they're incongruous, that forebode strife and trouble. Uh, one example in uh, uh, a German translation in uh, 1564 uh, of Pedro Mexia. Some of you may have heard the name. It's a, a great kind of compendium writer, writer of uh, the very popular in mid 16th century of peoples, uh, Moors, polities, right? Encyclopedia of uh, different Moors and peoples, right? Uh, so this German translation, uh, which is based on Mexia, but you know, uh, translates into German what Mexia was uh, talking about. Uh, uh, he says that, well, uh, this mixing and mingling strife creates opposition. In 1570, Wallace said again, this is a very productive author, he chimed in and he says that chaos is not only an incongruous entity, but one in which discrete parts fight to usurp functions that they are not ontologically built to assume. I would like to see this very much in the, in, in the social projection, to see uh, a, social condition, uh, a social condition projected into this, right? Uh, so, for example, the, he says, well, uh, the hands are attempting to see, the ears are uh, attempting to walk, uh, the feet are attempting to hear. Obviously, that doesn't work that way. Something is wrong. Uh, I don't think he came out of the blue with this idea. This is not like IKEA furniture, you know, take it and put it together. Uh, something must have been there that actually forced him to get to that point. Uh, in the opposite of this, however, just at the same time that uh, Walser was writing, uh, uh, a certain Michael Eitzing, describing Antwerp in uh, 1584, noted that chaos there, yeah, it's, it's a total chaos, he said, you know, all these people come everywhere with their traditions, etc. But you know what? Uh, this makes for a mutually beneficial uh, uh, competition through cooperation. And that's very, very important aspect because this incongruity, in a sense, actually can prove uh, to, to, to give a very positive sign to chaos. And uh, uh, this metaphor applies to a micro-social level as well. We have a very interesting example. It's a beautiful example. Actually, it's relatively well known, but I, I would like to point it out. Uh, uh, the upstart, there is this upstart merchant's son, an alchemist and uh, imperial servant called Jochen Richthausen, right, uh, who uh, became an imperial master in Vienna, an Oberkammergraft. He was ennobled. And uh, when he was in Hobart in 1659, he called himself Freiherr von Kahn. So, get about it. And put this on his, that, that was actually his coat of arms. Just to make sure that we're not, you know, here he gets the, uh, the globe on the cows and he gets this sign of the earth from the Kabbalistic science, or the, uh, the science of the, of the Kabbalistic science of the primary elements, right over here. Right, so chaos is our world, and I came from chaos. Now, I would like to know what he meant under chaos precisely. He doesn't tell that I kind of lived through some of his stuff. I couldn't figure out what he does, so he, maybe he never said it. But the fact is that he was proud of it, that he came out of chaos. You know, and that's it. That's where you come from. And that's what become you. I mean, he was a noble, you become a noble, you become a graph, you become an imperial servant that is mentioned in all sorts of heraldic uh, uh, guides and manuals, etc. So he clearly here considered chaos a springboard for vertical mobility. And he was proud of it. Right? Springboard for vertical mobility and proud of it. So that actually leads me to uh, the next point, which is the impact of chaos. What does chaos do if, if it propelled uh, Richthausen to, uh, to a new social level over there? Uh, in the negative tradition of old, uh, that obtained since the uh, early uh, 1500s, nothing good came out of, of chaos, right? nothing particularly of social chaos. And later on, of course, as the, 70, uh, the, sorry, as the 18th century progressed, that was, became the point, nothing come, nothing good, nothing good, nothing good, nothing good come, comes out of chaos. But that's not the case uh, in uh, uh, very, very uh, 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 broad uh, tradition that is well seen in, in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, one of the first thing, kind of good examples is uh, the uh, uh, sipping in Germany of the German translation of Nicolas de Montclos, 
uh, Bergeli de Juliet, uh, which is uh, a Roman, which is uh, one of the first Baroque Romans, and uh, uh, very popular, became very popular uh, in Western Europe and, 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 and had a good reception in Germany as well, several volumes. And it points to chaos as the fountain spring of love. I mean, obviously, uh, in the old uh, uh, Greek tradition, uh, uh, antique tradition, love is one of the first products of, that comes out of God chaos. But stressing precisely this is something that's very important because you can stress so many other things. He stressed love. Uh, now, uh, uh, this imagery circulated throughout the 17th century and again became popular. Rob is a particular thing, right? But uh, from the middle of the 17th century, more and more chaos was defined primarily and above all as the origin of all things. It is a key thing. I mean, there's so many things you can say about chaos, but when you choose to emphasize the fact that above all, chaos is the beginning of all things, that gives uh, gives it a very special, very special meaning. And this is uh, an uh, illustration to Ovid's uh, uh, Metamorphosis, actually the first two that we saw were also illustration to uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis. And here we have a, a certain gentleman called Johannes Pistorius uh, who contributed Latin and particularly German, German uh, uh, verses to, uh, to the engravings. And here we have it. Duch des Chaos uh, wird uh, and that is what he chose to put in there. Not anything else. Not clump, not verwirrung, not mishmash, but the fact that, well, the first beginning of our work, of course, we have God here. Now that's 1563 still. God is striding mightily over, over chaos, but uh, this is the important thing to me that, that now chaos gets qualified in, in this way. Uh, this has to do with the beginning of chaos. Very often, uh, when you uh, see German tradition, chaos is defined uh, so far as beginning is concerned, but historicity of chaos as time went on uh, uh, switched to, changed to. In the beginning of our period, chaos was predominantly, in the 1500s, predominantly a thing of the past. It has been made contemporary uh, by the medieval tradition, but in a very metaphorical sense. So it was primarily pointed out, yeah, in the beginning it was chaos, but there's going to be no more chaos, etc. Uh, but in the empire, uh, the free humanist Sebastian Frank projected chaos forward already in 1531. Uh, what he did, he do, what he revived the old idea of Janus House. Janus, the true faced god, uh, ancient god, a Roman god, particularly as it was known to, uh, to the Western Europeans. Uh, who looked but to past and, and, and future with the added bonus for Sebastian Frank that chaos rebirthed humanity in the age of, uh, in the guise of Noah. So to Frank, Noah is chaos too. Noah chaos, he put it, Noah, Noah slash uh, chaos. Jakob Böhme, whom I already uh, 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 mentioned in uh, 1620s, uh, elaborated the idea, which is that as old as law, uh, and to him, chaos is a process. From this, it was a very short step for Sandrart, this artist and, and architect, uh, uh, who discussed in 1674 the nature of light. And discussing the nature of light, he predicated light on the recurrence of chaos, which to him was darkness. So to him, uh, there was a daily, there is a daily cycle of verdecken und entdecken. So chaos comes, and goes every day. It's recurrency here. Every day we have cows and we don't have cows, right? So uh, conversely, in many authors in the uh, late 16th and 17th century, political instability could revert civilization uh, to chaos, uh, the total disintegration of, of, of society and politics. So chaos, therefore, can be negatively or positively charged and uh, particularly in the late 1600s with the coming of the 1700s, the millenarian uh, movements started uh, introducing more and more chaos in their discourses, talking about, oh, chaos, chaos, and all the year 1700 is coming, the end of the world is coming, uh, there's gonna be chaos again, right, the world ends. But the fact is, and I'm not concerned with the valuation, but the fact is that people of all sorts of valuation uh, 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 aspects began thinking of chaos as perpetual, cyclical and unavoidable. In other words, uh, Möbius strip, sort of. And that's precisely the image of chaos which Novalis had in uh, late uh, 1700s. Uh, the Möbius strip, 
one-sided, no future, no past, no time, no dimension into it. And, and that we have it already uh, 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 by, by the 1670s. And finally, <laughs> one last thing, uh, beyond the moral, beyond the rational, beyond the utility standards, there is your form, that is aesthetics. The demonized chaos of the 16th, 17th century was an ugly darkness, except for natural philosophy, as we know, right? So in natural philosophy's uh, uh, terms, uh, one example, Martin Schmuck, who put it very nicely in 1637, a proper chemical procedure will result in, quote, ein sehr schönes Chaos, end of quote. Uh, what he meant, I think, is a piece of shiny yellow metal. Uh, there's shown as counts, if you can make it as an alchemist, right? Uh, but again, the context and content does not interest me. What interests me is the form. Chaos can be beautiful. Uh, as with complexity, visual imagery mattered. Once again, if you, for example, were living in 1634, uh, 1634 and went to Copenhagen and attended to the wedding of the uh, crown prince Christian, right, to a German princess, you attended the great ceremony, and you see a new beginning symbolized by lots of processions, lots of flaws, and what you see is a handsome knight, very, very beautiful knight, right, carrying a wooden sphere, and on that sphere with gold letters, it's written chaos, right, gold letters. I mean, how could you perceive chaos but as something other than beautiful and noble? Particularly if you're a young lady, like look at the night, yeah, chaos is something real beautiful, damn it. Uh, so uh, visual imagery to me in this sense, well, sense images that uh, pertain to this and then you know, golden letters, right? Something expensive, something valuable, something noble and something, something beautiful. So <laughs> uh, if you allow me to begin wrapping it up, uh, very more, many more examples can be adduced. I'm not gonna bother you with all 4,200 references that I have. Uh, but I think the taxonomist evolution is, is more or less uh, clear at, at, at this point. The terms filled in the 1500s entailed in one-time entity that is characterized by passivity, uh, handled by a metaphysical agency, emptiness, lack, unsavory desolation, homogeneity, ugly uh, formlessness, frightful darknesses. Now flash forward from here to the third quarter of the 17th century, somewhere between 1650 and 1675, an entirely different picture comes to sight. Chaos, the entity, became the embodiment of creative power. It became orderly and rational. It was complex and diverse. It was composed of discrete sinking parts, not incongruous, but permitting, competing, and cooperating. It fostered vertical mobility. It evolved into a process, ahistorical and recurring. It was identified with our human world. And as it became a universal, it transcended morality and rationality, for these two are very, very contextual. So it was simply beautiful. Immersion in it entailed, as with Glimmerhausen, pleasant, enriching, heuristic experience. Now, the question is, what was the axis of that trajectory? Where was it its starting point? Where did it start? and where did it end in terms of uh, social cultural development. The progression to me appears to be the progression from pre-modern to modern. The conceptual field of chaos in the beginning of our period maps out the dimensions of pre-modernity. By 1650, 1675, most all of the aspects of the taxonomies that I outlined for you synced very nicely with the principles of modernity. Complexity replaces uniformity, Process takes over from stasis. The whole constantly produces, improves, and rejuvenates, fueled by a force of its own. It's forward-oriented, looks continuously toward the future, but remembers tradition. Agency is human, not metaphysical. Mobility spurred by a quest for knowledge, that curiosity of the Venuses that move from one world to another. Uh, identity is shaped by exposure to diversity. The world is an aggregate of discrete units, incongruity systemic. The parts are forged in competition. They're not ontologically the same. Interaction is free, but not random, right? Non-random irregularity. It obeys laws, such laws like, like equality for all. Permeability makes isolation impossible. We are not islands in the world. There is still one truth, 
but diversity requires uh, different ways to it. And all this, multiplicity, diversity, mobility, discreteness, equality, competition, are positive, not because they're moral, or because they're beautiful, uh, or because they're rational, but because they're beautiful. So to sum up, uh, my contention, which can be as long as possible, but uh, still I put it forward, is that the funda so far as the fundamental category of chaos is concerned, by 1650, 1675, German culture has elaborated the discursive framework of modernity. Not totally integrated, but not totally disjointed either. How that relates to other aspects of uh, living in the world, you're going to tell me. I don't yet know for sure. I got some, you know, some things, uh, some thoughts, but not exactly. I'll leave it to you to say. Uh, now, I know that this conclusion raises a whole lot of questions, particularly about the autonomy, if you wish, or independence of culture, and how cultures work with other developments. But it's an, one last thing I would like to uh, point out, uh, one last question that I would like to address very quickly. And that's the point of the bifurcation. Why we continue with this bifurcation of a relatively mild negativity of perceiving chaos today. Oh, it's a mess, but we can somehow deal with it. Maybe we not deal with it. It's it not exactly so. Uh, 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 so uh, to destroy us all or something like this, right? So uh, uh, mild negativity on the surface opposing the positive undercurrent. I cannot say for certain, but I would like to suggest a concept, and that concept is intertemporality. Intertemporality, uh, seen from the point of view of two traditions, one is deep history, and the other is psychosomatic, somatic history, actually. Deep history uh, claims that we have the experiences, our experiences, sedimented for the last uh, million years or so, sedimented on the brain architecture. For those, those of you who have not, I mean, I would assume you, of course, are familiar with it, I don't know how, how much you've dwelt into deep history. And so psychosomatic history or somatic history says that the norms and, uh, the norms and uh, uh, ideas that we have are somatically working uh, throughout. So my contention is that the, uh, uh, the two currents coexist because pre-modernity works very nicely with uh, negative image of chaos. Modernity works very nicely with uh, the positive image of chaos. And deep history and psychosomatic history tell us that we're never fully modern and never fully pre-modern. The two currents coexist in us and get triggered at any moment depending on context. So these two things, pre-modern and modern, are always in, constant, in, in kind of a constant opposition between us, right? And uh, uh, they oppose and correct each other uh, depending on time. I don't know about you, uh, but uh, I like it this way. Thank you.